You know, I never quite realized just how many horror games there really were on the Wii. I guess the idea of using the Wii Remote as a flashlight really went a long way. Amongst these games was a first-person horror adventure game called Calling, where the gimmick is that the Wii Remote is your cell phone. You can see what they did there with the title, where the two L's and the I are supposed to be reception bars, which was kind of a nice touch, I guess. Uh, I see a lot of people mistitle this game as The Calling, but uh, no, it's it's just, it's just Calling. I don't I don't know why everyone puts the in front of it. Well, I guess the calling does roll a little easier off the tongue, so that's probably why. Oh, dang. Hudson made this game. I had no idea. Rest in peace, good man. <laughs> guess I got bored of making Bomberman and decided to have a go at the horror genre. Alright, uh, in this game, you use the Wii Remote as if it were a cell phone. It even gives you a recommended volume level and everything. The gimmick of the game is that all of the cell phone audio comes out of the Wii Remote, and you're supposed to bring it to your ear to listen to it. However, the speakers in my Wii Remotes don't really work that well anymore, but luckily there's an option that just plays all of it out of the TV. It kinda loses the novelty, yeah, but I'm sure it would've gotten old fast anyway. The first thing we see is an exchange between several people in a chat room. The four of them read an article that by using this chat room called The Black Page, you'd be able to speak to the dead. They continue to discuss the mysterious deaths of several high school students, and before long, a mysterious user named Kuro Neko joins. After a simple hello from her, everybody blacks out and wakes up in a strange other world. The tutorial stage has us controlling this dweebo kid named Shin Suzutani. The game plays like a typical first person adventure game on the Wii, you know, using the cursor to aim and turn, and the joystick to move. Thank God. After playing Juon, you really grow to appreciate basic joystick controls on Wii. At first, I found the motion control to be way too sensitive, and with no option to change it, I just had to adjust to it. It wasn't too bad once I got the hang of it, but it sure did take a lot of adjusting. Coming to realize that all actions are controlled by the pointer on screen rather than actual motion really helped. Opening a door, for example. I just couldn't get it to work too well because at first I kept moving the controller in the motion to open a door You know like you'd think but it turns out you just aim the pointer to either the right or the left to open and close it Same thing goes for opening cupboards and drawers man You do a lot of that in this game not a fan of that at all I think we need a name for this you know games where you have to look through way too many drawers and cupboards I think games like Deus Ex and Resident Evil 7 really got it right You know you have to have some empty drawers or or otherwise it's not believable, but that doesn't mean you have to have this many. I'm gonna call this Amnesia Syndrome, since that was the first game I really played that had this. But even that game didn't have it this bad. I mean, look at this room. It really just becomes tedious, and you have to check every single one, because one of them does have a key item, more or less all of the time, so you can't risk not looking through some of them and having missed something important. Just food for thought. Have less drawers and cupboards. Please. I mean, don't get me wrong, I completely understand that the feeling of rummaging through a room is greatly enhanced by mechanics like this, but there's a level where it's just too much. Anyway, now that I'm done complaining about something dumb, why don't we talk about something that's kinda neat? You'll use your cell phone for a wide variety of actions. Sometimes you'll use it to record the conversations of ghosts, giving you a little bit of story exposition, but you'll mostly use it for dialing different numbers. So essentially, these four people from the chat room were all transported to a purgatory-like dimension between life and the afterlife. They call this place the Mnemonic Abyss, though in the game they pronounce it Minimonic, which I don't think is right. This world can be manipulated by using your cell phone. If you dial the number of another phone, you'll be teleported to that phone, dropping your old phone in the process. So the gameplay relies heavily around trying to find new phone numbers and in turn getting to new areas. Well, the later chapters do that anyway. The first half of the game mostly takes place and larger areas that you'll have to thoroughly explore. The main two are a school and a hospital, each one sporting multiple floors and many, many rooms to search. Keeping that Silent Hill tradition, most of the doors you just straight up can't go in. The game doesn't even make any excuses, there's just no button prompt when you approach most of them. They're easily distinguishable though, because these rooms aren't even marked on the map, so it's pretty easy to keep track of where you can and cannot go. One thing that really pissed me off about this game is that if you haven't 
haven't found the flashlight yet, the game will not let you pick up most items. The game makes up this really stupid excuse, uh, I, I can't see well enough to pick that up. What are you talking about? It's right there. I I'm looking at it. I can see it. You can't tell me what I can and cannot see, dude. If you really have to be that dead set on not letting me pick these things up if I haven't got the flashlight yet, either A, make it actually dark in here, or B, pick a better excuse. The gameplay generally focuses on exploration, you know, walking around, investigating your surroundings, trying to find items or notes that'll advance the plot. A lot of the plot is told through these notes, which I'm not usually a fan of. I think it's a great idea to use reading material to enhance a plot, but when you make it where the core of the plot is, the game just gets really, really wordy. I know that doesn't bother a lot of people, but personally, it can be a little bit of a turnoff, especially if I don't find the plot that interesting. Not to say the game's plot isn't interesting though. It's honestly not half bad. The four people transported to the mnemonic abyss are Shin, a dweebo high school kid, Ren, a 21-year-old college student, Chiyo, an elderly woman hoping to talk to her deceased husband, and Makoto, an editor for an occult magazine who's searching for his partner who mysteriously passed away without explanation. You'll play as Shin for the first 10 minutes, and there's one chapter about Chiyo looking for her husband, but the bulk of the game is spent in Ren and Makoto's shoes. As you explore the area, you'll have many run-ins with ghosts. Um, these encounters are really dumb. Getting attacked by ghosts just requires flailing the weird mode around to shake them off. It doesn't actually make too much sense to me, honestly. If ghosts are non-physical, how do you shake them off. I don't know. Either way, just flail the remote around violently and you'll be fine. If you can time it just right, you can also press the A button to escape the encounter immediately. Doing it this way seems to recover a little bit of health, or I guess the uh, the horror meter as the game calls it. It's pretty self-explanatory. If it's in the green, you're good. Uh, red, not so much. This is only something you really need to pay attention to if ghosts are actively pursuing you and will attack you multiple times. Otherwise, it just refills by itself. I can't really say encounters with the ghosts are particularly scary. It's so easy to break free of them that they just feel more like a hindrance than a real threat. That and their designs just aren't that scary at all. I mean, they're just kind of like blue school children that are kinda see-through. If you want some real spooky students, check out Silent Hill's Great Children. Now those things freak me out. These guys, on the other hand, not so much. But just because the ghosts aren't scary doesn't mean the game isn't scary at all. Uh, while I didn't find the ghosts scary, there were a couple of decent tricks in there. Like when walking upstairs, your character automatically goes up them as if it's a cutscene, but you're still able to aim the flashlight during it, giving a player just enough input that makes you real realize that this event is still running in real time and as such doesn't necessarily mean it's entirely scripted. One that kind of got me a little bit was this girl who's standing on the steps who quickly vanishes. There's no sound, no announcement, she's just there and she's normally not. It's subtle and decently effective. The one that kept really getting me though is that sometimes when you unpause the game there's a ghost in your face and it silently runs away. It's like borderline jump scare, yeah, but I'm willing to forgive it because A, it didn't actually pop up at me, and B, it doesn't make any noise, it's just kind of there when you return. Not a bad idea, honestly, and it didn't give me a heart attack either, just a good little spook, and I do like that. The game does have some actual jump scares though, but they're surprisingly quiet, something swooshing on by. They are kind of dumb, but at least they're not in-your-face obnoxious, you know? But yeah, anyway, the gameplay consists purely of exploring and thoroughly searching each room for items, notes, or anything you can use to advance the plot. This can can get a tad tedious though, especially when you're in one of the larger areas like the school or the hospital. Of course, like I mentioned before, the map does make it easy to tell where you've explored and where you haven't, but even still, it can be really easy to miss things and end up walking in circles for half an hour, wondering what the hell to do. It's happened to me on multiple occasions just to find that, oh yeah, I did just miss a tiny object in a room that I previously explored. Because of this, I really think the game works best when you're exploring multiple small areas instead of one big one. When you're playing as Makoto halfway through the game, you'll frequently dial numbers to go to different small locations. Basically, the goal of each room is to find another number to dial. This is the part of the game I actually really liked. It's not overwhelming with too much space to explore, and instead, it gives it to you piece by piece, room by room, and sometimes there's puzzles where you have to go back to a previous room. For example, when you see this grudge-looking hair all over a door, you gotta figure out that you have to go back to the hair 
salon to find a pair of scissors, return and use the scissors to cut the hair. The game actually does have some pretty good puzzles, stuff like decrypting numbers on a calendar to get a code, but in a way that makes sense given the context. The puzzles are very similar to the ones you find in Silent Hill, but with a greater element of real world logic that makes them a little easier to get on the right track with. But between the cool puzzles and the fun rooms to solve, the game can really drag on with those larger areas. Whether you'll have the patience to sit through it, I guess really depends on how invested you find yourself in the story, which I do admit I enjoyed quite a bit. Except the English voice acting. It's really freaking bad. It's not even like funny bad. It's, 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 hor it's horrible. <laughs> I'm so glad to meet someone who isn't dead. Who are you? Oh, I'm Shin Suzutani. Oh my lord. Luckily, you can change the voices to the original Japanese audio, which sounds much better. That is, if you don't mind having your eyes glued to the bottom of the screen the whole game. Strangely enough, the game follows this really weird structure where it just gives you a bad ending halfway through the game, but then it restarts continuity and you start playing as Makoto, but then it offers to let you replay the chapters you already played. Uh, you can skip them, but I hear there's extra content and secrets upon replaying them. So I did replay a couple, but I didn't find anything like that at all. But then again, I guess I already knew what to do and I kind of sped through them. So if you do decide to replay these chapters, make sure you give the areas another thorough look instead of just running through them like I did. But yeah, that's um the calling. That's for that's calling, even I'm making that mistake now. That's calling for the Wii. Um, I didn't love it, I didn't hate it. It's a fairly average game, but there are a handful of neat ideas and it has a fairly decent story. Um, as far as horror games go on the Wii, you can do a lot worse. You can do a lot worse. If you're interested, I'd say it's a fairly harmless investment. You know, it's not gonna be the best horror game you ever play, but there's a couple of decent spooks in there and you might really like the story. So it's at least got that much going for it. Um, come to think of it, now's a good time to get it too because this used to be a rare game. This used to be pretty expensive online, but not too long ago they did a reprint of it. So it's a lot cheaper than it used to be on like eBay or whatever. In fact, when I bought this copy off eBay, it was still factory sealed. And this one's still factory sealed. I, I don't know why I bought two.